back to our schematic on the differences between the neuromuscular junction and the central nervous system, we now have covered metabotropic receptors, the different neurotransmitters, and synaptic summation, which already gives us a pretty good idea on how neurons in the central nervous system are different from neurons in the neuromuscular junction. The final aspect that I want to cover now is a bit hidden under the lines of the differences shown here. As I mentioned multiple times, neurons in the central nervous system experience very weak inputs but in very large quantities, whereas the neuromuscular junction is essentially one large input on the muscle. This difference, as we've seen, leads to the concept of synaptic integration, but it also leads to the idea of plasticity. Basically, due to the fact that the inputs are so small in the central nervous system, it leaves room for them to be modulated, so to increase or decrease their strength, which is known as plasticity. The notion of plasticity is fundamental to the well-being of our nervous system because it is through these mechanisms that we learn and remember. Now, when we think about a presynaptic neuron communicating with a postsynaptic partner, the signal propagation between the two is dependent in both the presynaptic and postsynaptic partners. Indeed, to appropriately relay the message, the presynaptic cell must exocytose its neurotransmitters such that the postsynaptic receptors can introduce it into a passive signal that might reach the threshold. If, for some reason, the presynaptic input is decreased, maybe there is an issue with release of transmitters, or there are no more vesicles or whatever it might be, the diminished quantity of neurotransmitter release will impact the signal made on the postsynaptic cell. Also, the converse is true. If there are more transmitters released, then the response will be bigger. We can also imagine on the postsynaptic cell, if there are more or less receptors to pick up the signal, the response will also be modulated accordingly. Hence, plasticity can occur on either the presynaptic and or the postsynaptic side. Before we jump into the different mechanisms of plasticity, I want to mention right away that a sizable portion of plasticity mechanisms are rooted in the probabilistic nature of the synapse. For that reason, I want to begin our discussion by first describing the binomial model of the synaptic release, which we will later use to help us better interpret certain aspects of plasticity. If you recall from our discussion on the neuromuscular junction, you might remember in the experiment carried by Katz, as well as Boyd and Martin, that the release of unitary vesicles was entirely stochastic or in other words probabilistic. In the framework of this experiment, the bottom line was that by using a probabilistic model, we were able to support the idea that each vesicle were a unit because they had a fixed amount of depolarization that they produced on the postsynaptic cell. Now, knowing that, or at least having strong supporting evidence that synapses act in a probabilistic manner, I want to use a simple probabilistic model to create a tool for us. The probabilistic model in question that I will use is the binomial distribution. If you are not familiar with this distribution, let me give you a brief rundown of its main elements. To do so, let's first consider a simple conceptual example. Imagine that in a bowl, there are three red balls and four blue balls. What will be the probability P to pick up two red balls in three independent trials? To solve this problem, let's first establish some variables. We have three independent trials, which we will call N, two successes within these trials, which we will call X, and from the context that we have here, we know that out of the seven total balls, there are three red balls, so the probability to pick up a red ball in a given event is three out of seven. This probability is known as the probability of success, and it is important that it remains constant. It turns out that we can model our variables and determine the probability of X successes in N independent trials with this equation, which represents the binomial distribution. Also, the expected value of this distribution is equal to the number of trials N times the probability P. When we apply it to a problem, we get that the probability to pick two red balls out of three trials is about 30%, and that we expect a value of about 1.29. The expected value in our case means that we should expect to pick 1.29 red balls in three trials. Now, it doesn't really make too much sense here, as decimal balls don't exist, but it will be important shortly. Finally, I want to touch quickly on this term here, which reads as n choose x. This is an important factor in our equation, because it corresponds to the number of ways there are to choose a red ball x times out of n. In our example, there are three ways. Now that we understand this, let's apply that knowledge to a synapse. Let's start from the equation we had in our conceptual problem and redefine the variables. The probability P of success in our case here will be the probability of vesicles being released, 
which we will call p-vesicle. We will assume that the event of vesicle release is all or nothing and its probability remains constant. Now, when it comes to n, instead of thinking in terms of trials, we can think in terms of quantas that are released. It turns out that in the central nervous system, it is not uncommon to impose the limit of quantas to the number of release sites. In our left diagram, n is currently equal to 1. But if an additional release site was to be added, then n can equal to 2, or if another one is added, then n can equal to 3. This sort of assumes that each release site releases one quanta only. Otherwise, we could have modeled n as being the number of quanta released per site, so 1 in this case, or 3 in this one. To avoid any complications, I will stick to the release sites, as it makes it a bit more intuitive in my opinion. For x, it will be similar to the conceptual example. It will correspond to the number of vesicles released within the trials. The final variable that we will consider will be the quantal amplitude of a vesicle, and it will be used to multiply our expected value to scale it in units that we are used to seeing like voltage or current. This is especially important if you want to test our model in experimental conditions, because the recordings in the laboratory will be made in voltage or current units. Now, let's do a quick example to see how these variables operate. Imagine a synapse with only one synaptic site, so n equals 1. If the probability of release is 0.4 and the quantal amplitude is 2 millivolts, what will be the probability to release one vesicle? Also, what will be the average response at this synapse? In this problem, since we only have one site, well, the probability to release one vesicle will be 0.4 accordingly. For the average response, we can use our equation of the expected value and determine that the average response would be about 0.8 millivolts. This example was rather straightforward, so let's see another one that might be a bit more challenging. What will be the probability to release 0, 1, 2, and 3 vesicles if there are three synaptic sites? Again, what will be their average response at this synapse? To do this problem, I want to introduce a new variable named p failure, which corresponds to 1 minus p vesicle. To make it more convenient, we will call this variable q. Now, by using the binomial equation, we can find the probability for each scenario. For example, the probability that no vesicles will be released is 0.216, the probability that one will be released is 0.432, and so on up to three vesicles. In instances like this, where we have many synaptic contacts, the combination term is very important because it presents the different possible combinations of the scenarios that can occur. For example, for one vesicle released, it can either be the left one, the middle one, or the right one that fires. Hence, there are three possibilities for firing, and the same logic applies to the other cases. When it comes to the average response, we can use our equation to arrive at the answer of 2.4 millivolts. There is also an alternative way to get this response, and it is by summing the product between the probability and the quantal amplitude at each site. This will give us 2.4 millivolts as well. Now, the case with multiple synaptic sites can be a bit tricky to understand what is going on, and to help ourselves, we can refer to a graph to have a better intuitive idea. On this graph, we will plot the probability for each scenario as a function of the quantal amplitude. So for x equals 2, for example, we have a probability of 2.88, and it is associated with a quantal amplitude of 4. You will notice that from this graph, we can get the probability of a certain event from the area under the curve, and we can also get the number of synaptic contacts just by looking at the non-failure peaks. Since there are three non-failure peaks, we know that our synapse has three presynaptic terminals. Finally, in cases with multiple synaptic sites, so when n is over 1, we can establish a new variable called p synapse, and this variable corresponds to the summed probability of release vesicles. In our case, this probability equals to 0.784. We can relate p synapse with p vesicle in this relation. To make sure you understand what is going on, I suggest you to try and derive this relation. All the necessary information to do so is shown here. All right, now that we understand this binomial model, let's begin our discussion on plasticity. A fundamental aspect of plasticity is that it can happen on many timescales. The two broad ways to classify these timescales is through the short term and the long term. Accordingly, let's begin with short term plasticity which corresponds to events that last on the scale of a few minutes or less. Generally speaking, short-term plasticity occurs on the presynaptic terminal 
and the two main forms are called paired pulse facilitation and paired pulse depression. To see how plasticity occurs, we always need to consider a baseline response, so pre-plasticity and post-plasticity response. For that reason, we will need at least two consecutive pulses delivered to the presynaptic terminal to be able to see any changes in the synaptic strength. All right, let's begin with paired pulse facilitation. To see how it occurs, let's plot the membrane potential of the postsynaptic neuron and the current that will be injected in the presynaptic cell. When two quick successive pulses are sent, paired pulse facilitation results in the second depolarization on the postsynaptic cell to be larger than the first one. Based on different studies, the leading hypothesis on how this might occur is from residual calcium accumulating in the presynaptic cell, which causes more vesicles to be released. This phenomenon is also believed to occur mostly at low-release probability synapses. Let's see how. First, remember that on presynaptic terminals, there are generally two communities of vesicles, the ones who are ready to be released, which form the readily releasable pool, and the ones that are in the reserve pool waiting to be docked at the membrane. When the first pulse comes and depolarizes the terminal, a certain amount of calcium, here shown in blue, enters the cell and the fraction of it is used to release vesicles, which generates the first response in the postsynaptic neuron. The other fraction of the calcium remains in the terminal, and when the second pulse arrives shortly after, it adds on calcium that causes even more neurotransmitters to be released. Hence, the second pulse becomes bigger because more receptors get activated. In this scenario, the fact that the synapse has a low release probability is important because it ensures that the presynaptic terminal has the necessary amount of vesicles ready at the edge of the membrane to be released on the second pulse. Now, for paired pulse depression, the second pulse causes the response on the postsynaptic cell to be smaller than the first one. This form of synaptic plasticity is believed to occur from vesicle depletion in high-release probability synapses. At these high probability synapses, the first pulse causes the readily releasable pool to exocytose very quickly most of the vesicles it has, so when the second pulse comes, there are less vesicles that are ready to be released, and that causes the second postsynaptic response to be lower. You will notice that there is a very important time dependence to these two mechanisms. If the second pulse is delayed too long relative to the first, then the calcium would have time to dissipate and the vesicles would have time to return. So, the timing of the second pulse is critical for these types of plasticity to happen. Also, as I said, since the vesicles can reform quickly and the calcium gets buffered quickly as well, it explains why these two forms of plasticity act on the short term. In mathematical terms, we can quantify the amount of paired pulse facilitation or paired pulse depression from the paired pulse ratio and paired pulse facilitation metrics. In the paired pulse ratio, we take the ratio of the second amplitude over the first. In cases of facilitation, the ratio will be above 1, and in cases of depression, the ratio will be below 1. For the paired pulse facilitation metric, we do the same thing, but in the numerator we subtract the amplitude of the first response. If the value is positive, it corresponds to facilitation, and inversely, if the value is negative, it corresponds to depression. Now that we understand a bit more how plasticity occurs in the short term, let's explore the long-term aspect. To do so, we will consider an important area in the brain named the hippocampus that has been instrumental in the discovery and the development of synaptic plasticity. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.